we're at a point right now, regretfully, that the cost of our failures to act around these burning things is higher than the cost of acting, which is sad in one, in one respect. But on the other hand, I look at it as the biggest opportunity. And the good thing is, increasingly, business understands that. They understand they have to be part of the solution, but they also see that it's a tremendous opportunity. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Mark de Swanarons of the Institute for Real Growth, welcoming you and also welcoming a special guest today, Paul Pullman. Uh, you've been introduced and talked about a lot as a leader at P&G, at Nestle, at Unilever. I like to introduce you as the only businessman in the room, business person in the room when the United Nations worked on developing the SDGs, I think that's quite an accolade. Founder of Imagine and chair at the Said Business School, but now also author, author of the book Net Positive, which is the reason we're regrouping. Paul, welcome, and where are you and how are you? No, thank you, Mark, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm actually in snowy Geneva right now. It's coming down <laughs> quite heavily, so strange. Last week we were baking in the sun and today it's uh, freezing, but anyway. The more important things to focus on. Well, to that point, uh, I look back at our first conversation and um, the thing we talk about most at the beginning is COVID because that had just really hit the world. And, uh, and now, of course, we can't really start any conversation without talking about uh, Ukraine. Um, is this the new normal, the world in such flux? Well, I think it should not be a surprise and we shouldn't call it the new normal because we've actually been in it a long time. As long as we basically don't address these, uh, these burning issues that we've been talking about a long time, especially uh, climate change and inequality, uh, by the way, both closely related, you see all the other things happening and the other things are really spin-offs of that. We destroy biodiversity at a rate we've never done. We create zoonotic diseases like COVID because we destroy biodiversity. We get uh, climate change at levels that are beyond our control. Uh, once we get these diseases and climate change, it's the poor people that suffer most and always pay the highest price. People increasingly okay. become dissatisfied, elect populist or nationalist in governments. Uh, conflicts start to emerge, climate conflicts, water conflicts, and, and many other ones. And this is what is all coming together. Huh? This is a, an explosion, if you want to, if you don't deal with the issues. And we're at a point right now, regretfully, that the cost of our failures to act around these burning things is higher than the cost of acting, which is sad in one, in one respect. But on the other hand, I look at it as the biggest opportunity. And the good thing is, increasingly, business understands that. They understand they have to be part of the solution but they also see that it's a tremendous opportunity. One of the reasons why you see finally the financial market waking up and moving. I don't think they move uh, for moral reasons, but they certainly move when they see an opportunity. Or a risk indeed. And, uh, and I think you, you're starting to get at um, why perhaps you wrote this book. And I do want to ask that question, but before we go there, um, there must have been a moment when you held the first copy of the book. And do you remember that moment? What did that feel like? <laughs> well, I must say, it feels a little bit like a, a baby being born. You know, I never wanted to write a book, to be honest. I've always had this notion, right or wrongfully so, that CEOs writing books was either to stroke their egos or to rewrite uh, history. And frankly, <laughs> both of those are not of interest to me. And I'm not a very patient person. So sitting down, writing a book is not something that uh, was very appealing to me. But, you know, I found Andrew Winston, who has written two uh, great books that I liked, uh, uh, The Big Pivot and From Green to Gold. I asked him to write it with me. He brought another perspective from an outside in, an American perspective, more like that. And, and together we had a great time writing it. But I must say, indeed, when you finally can say, uh, I've written a book and I know you, already went through that feeling but um you know it's an accomplishment it's it's a thing you do on top of and COVID probably provided the right moment for us to do this not only because we had a little bit more time that we could uh, attribute to this but more importantly i think it has driven home the need for 
why what we're trying to uh, share with people in the book is so relevant. So, so w w when you think about the book now, what is it, six, eight months after publication and seeing what a success it is, do you think you've, you've captured everything that what you feel is important in it? Well, the book uh, came out in November and obviously uh, it takes a little bit to get going when you have the Christmas month. We're uh, heading north of 100,000 copies and, and we're giving talks to many companies. We're getting into the academic institutions, which we have targeted to drive change. And I think increasingly we're seeing signs that uh, net positive is becoming a new reference. For us, the book is really uh, one of the tools that we're using uh, to create a movement to um, change our mindsets of what good looks like. And I think the moment has been very... Uh, uh, um, you know, well called by by coincidence, uh, once more, uh, and and the interest is uh, tremendous. Uh, you see uh, that in in science like uh, the the demand for ESG specialists or the uh, different sectors of society now increasingly moving at a the faster speed to uh, internalize some of these external challenges. And the book is a very simple how book um, to help people based on a you know, on the experience of a practitioner who ran a, a big uh, publicly traded multinational that you know very well, uh, Paul Unilever. So it's a very practical book on on how to get going and how to implement what probably is the biggest challenge that many CEOs have faced in their careers. Uh, that's particularly the point why you're actually the only person to be here for a second time, because the how is how is the Institute for Real Growth. We try and help the people that are listening and looking today, very much roadmaps and so forth. And so indeed, I'd, I'd like to jump into that. But you mentioned um, that it is one of the tools. So maybe before we jump into the tool, we can talk about the tool set. How do you see the times right? What is the tool set that you see available? So perhaps, Mark, what we're trying to do, I should have explained a little bit more is, but most of the companies are in the CSR mode, corporate social responsibility. They know there's an issue out there. So they like to make some claims about uh, climate uh, CO2 reduction, carbon emission reductions. They like to make some claims of less plastics in the ocean. It just doesn't look good. They don't want to really be associated with too much deforestation in their value chains. So broadly, companies have moved and, and perhaps it feels exhausting as they have uh, really made a step change in all honesty versus uh, what probably their predecessors have done. But in reality, we're not moving fast enough. Uh, the world is uh, 4.6 billion years old. And uh, if I put it on the scale of 46 years to make it simple, human beings have been here for four hours. The Industrial Revolution started one minute ago. And in that one minute, we've lost 50% of the world's forests. We've lost in the last five decades, 68% of the world's species, vertebrates, mammals and birds. Only 8% of what we produce gets reused. I think we're starting to discover, and perhaps COVID was a moment of, of a reflection, that we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. And anything you can do forever is by definition unsustainable. And here I'm talking to the marketing community that basically was created and was educated under uh, trying to convince all of us to have more growth and to buy more stuff and, and so forth. But the way we've been educated on that and the way we've been actually doing that is just frankly um, sustainable climate change the bigger element that needs to be solved inequality obviously the other one that is uh, increasingly hurting us and it, it tells you that we've forgotten people we've forgotten humanity that's why i like your uh, initiative where you also have called it uh, human growth and we've uh, we've forgotten about the planet and future generations so with our movements, what we're trying to do is, is to say, move from CSR, corporate social responsibility, to RSC, responsible social corporations. In a world that has overshot such, uh, to such an extent its planetary boundaries, in fact, World Overshoot Day was July 29th last year, which is the day that we use up more resources than the world can replenish. Every day after that, we're actually stealing from future generations. So less bad is like, you know, I used to murder 10 people, now I murder five people. Now I, murder mm. I don't think so. So we need to get out of this thinking of less bad 
and start to, and then people say it's sustainable. Okay, I'll try to be sustainable. And you see a lot of net zero claims coming up, but sustainable is not good, not bad. And in a world that has overshoot its planetary boundaries, the only thing that works is to think restorative, reparative, regenerative. Regenerative, yeah. And positive. And, and this book is as much about your own transformation as a leader which is at the roots of your company's transformation, as well as the company's transformation being at the roots of the broader societal transformations. And that's what we're trying to take the readers through okay. from simply uh, chapter by chapter. Well, so you, you, you've, you've touched on a few points there that I want to connect back to as we go through this conversation. Um, but um, first, the time you you mentioned COVID as a wake up call, perhaps a time to reflect. Um, just in your book intro, you write that this book is in service of. What is is this the time, and what do you see as your role with this book? Well, my role is a very simple one, and actually a very enlightening one. Uh, you know, there are different types of authority. Uh, one is bought authority, and many people use that. Uh, you see the, 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 the power of the billionaire, so to speak, the money in politics. That's what is called bought authority. Not a good thing, in my opinion. Then you have formal authority. I used to be the CEO of Unilever. You have 175,000 people working for you. You have a big company. People want to get your telephone number and want to be in the meetings with you. That is bought authority. But now I've really moved to the next stage of my life, which I carefully timed, which is um, what I would call moral authority. And actually, it's much more powerful. Uh, I used the last five years of my tenure, tenure in Unilever to see this, how I could use the size and scale of Unilever, its credibility that it had built internally, its seat at the table that it had earned. How could I use that size and scale to drive the more transformative changes? Uh, many CEOs uh, understand what, what to some extent needs to be done, and they're trying to optimize their own companies, but optimizing within a system that frankly isn't designed to deliver only brings you so far. And the broader changes that we now need to make, the deeper changes of decarbonizing our global economy, rethinking our food systems, our mobility systems, etc., require all of us to work together, uh, government, civil society, and, uh, and the private sector. And this is where most of the CEOs struggle in these broader transformations. Not many of these partnerships succeed. Not many are trained to do it. And frankly, companies by themselves probably don't have that uh, trust or that authority or that license to operate at that level at this point in time. That's why I created Imagine. That's why I'm working on some of the other initiatives that I'm involved in, just to drive these more transformative changes. So what this book is trying to do is really to create that movement. And the movement needs to work at different levels. It needs to work at the senior level in companies, the people we're talking to now. We simply don't have enough time, so we need to accelerate uh, the transformation of people that are currently in power. And hopefully this is a helpful addition. Uh, then we're trying to work with universities. We clearly have failed to uh, create the right leaders. Uh, all the MBA programs, uh, business programs, which is still the most followed uh, education in the world, uh, basically creates little Milton Friedman's on steroids, and we are paying a dear price for that. So we need to change education. And then we work with the third group for us, which are the youth movements. In fact, a lot of change is coming from young people, millennials, Gen Z, uh, also inside of companies, by the way. For the first time, the great resignation, the walkouts, it's basically young people driving that transformation. So we're pushing on the three levers of change. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying to do that with uh, surveys, with um, um, scorecards that companies can measure themselves against, uh, with some other tools that we're now making available. Um, and, and fortunately, we're starting to see first and foremost people talk about net positive, increasingly feedback from companies that are updating their strategies and, and thinking a little bit more courageously net positive. And that's really what I'm trying to achieve. I'm at the states of life now that really all what I can do is give back and all what I can do is ensure that, uh, that we don't pass these uh, tremendous challenges on to uh, our future generation. That's our obligation, that's our duty. More authority, very clear and a clear step. Now, as you engage with leaders, do you find 
talking about this imperative for change, that people are seeing it as almost um, something that now needs to happen? Or do they recognize that there is a going back to the future, uh, going back to basics? This is how business used to be before Phil Miltman Friedman. What, what is most powerful as an engagement concept, do you think? Well, what most what is most powerful as an engagement concept is uh, is actually opportunity. You know, business has to serve multiple stakeholders. Uh, for many businesses, the shareholder has still a disproportionate weight in that equation of stakeholders. And uh, you know, if you want to get their attention, you uh, can only work on on two things. If you want to, you can work on the moral side of it, which is difficult to move that fast on that. But you can work on that, work on employees, work on their children and 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 have them increase reality, understanding of reality. And that uh, is a catalyzer for change. But the most important and most powerful catalyzer for change uh, still in our economic system is to make the economics work in your favor and to align the interest of the shareholders with the longer term multiple stakeholders. And I think we're starting to be at that point. What COVID has shown us is um, the enormous cost that we incur if we don't act earlier. COVID itself is not a surprise, as you know, Mark. We've had many zoonotic diseases directly related to the destruction of biodiversity. We uh, had SARS, Zika, Ebola, Asian flu. So COVID should not have been a surprise. What was the surprise perhaps is the severity, our inability to work together as global citizens to act uh, disgraceful that the emerging markets will only have 15% vaccination. Uh, those are the surprises. But we've seen the enormous cost of it and how difficult it is to come out of that, even now where you see these stress points in the economy um, that we have created. Uh, the total cost of COVID in Europe and the US alone um, to save lives and livelihoods has been about $17 trillion. Kristalina from the IMF estimates that we've lost $25 trillion in this decade alone in GDP. That is infinitely more than how much we have to spend to avoid these issues in the first place. So I think uh, the business community, which always can easily understand that they don't want more climate change or inequality or people going to bed hungry, they, um, they now see that it increasingly actually becomes not only a risk mitigation, but a big opportunity. And that's the reason why you see the financial market uh, moving. And, and the financial market itself is actually becoming a, a key catalyzer for change increasingly. So that's why you well, see yeah. this legislation. That's why you see citizens moving in their purchasing uh, decisions. That's why you see employees moving in the choices they make for the companies they want to work for. So all these things add up to create a movement. The issue is not anymore there. The direction is set. Companies understand that. The issue is that collectively we're just not moving with the speed and scale that is needed. Right. And that's, that is so, where we need to focus on. Well, and, and, and let's get to that. And the, you, you describe in your book a roadmap. And, uh, and, and there's a clear step one. Uh, perhaps you can talk about getting into that journey. So many people, I think, are actually converted now on the need but hesitate on the actual getting in for many reasons. Uh, what is the first step and, and why is it so important to start there? Well, the, the, the first thing is always, it seems impossible until it's done. The famous quote from, uh, from Nelson Mandela, but increasingly it is possible. And any study and study that we do shows that this conversion to a greener, more inclusive economy doesn't only position your company better for the future, uh, doesn't only result in increasingly higher valuation from the financial market, but also um, is, is, uh, is more resilient, is more job creating, et cetera, et cetera. So what you need is to work on, on a few different areas. Obviously, your personal alignment, you need your values alignment, you need your mission alignment, you need your structural alignment. So all these things uh, are clear. Uh, our book, uh, and if you follow the sequence of the book, we firmly believe that it starts at the top. You can't have a um, sustainable company if you're not sustainable yourself. You can't have a purpose-driven company if you're not purposeful yourself. So healing organizations in that sense starts with self-healing. And um, the first chapter that we start with is uh, actually calling uh, unlocking the company's soul to some extent. We start with, do you care? How do you make uh, purpose 
Uh, how do you understand what your individual purpose is? How do you leverage that up to the company purpose? And how do you make that the cornerstone of your corporate strategy? To make it come alive, uh, Mark, very simply, in Unilever, I deliberately took the whole leadership team to Port Sunlight to, um, to um, the house of uh, Lord Lever um, that uh, unfortunately burned down recently, which is not good news. But uh, the reason I did that was I, I took a page out of the book from Jim Collins, From Good to Great, Nurture the Core yeah. Before You Stimulate Progress, and really trying to understand what made that company tick. Uh, and going back to these deep uh, origins and, and the purpose of the company. For Lord Lever, it was making hygiene commonplace in Victorian Britain, where one out of two babies didn't make it either past year one at the end of the 19th century. We translated that after a lot of work and soul searching to making sustainable living commonplace. And uh, with Bill George, uh, I always liked his book, Two Norse, and uh, with the help of some others, we went through our personal uh, purpose journey, which still is uh, one of the most uh, popular training courses in Unilever. And I think they've put nearly 100,000 people through it by now. And wow. So out of that, why am I spending a little bit more time on purpose? Because that allows you to have the employees write themselves on the story and own the story if you want to, but also allows you to unleash uh, the human magic by creating the right environment. For us, it gave us courage. It gave us courage to say, you know, we need to be much bolder in our goals that we set. We need to take a responsibility of our total impact in the world. Uh, not only scope one and two under our control, but everything. If you're in the food business, that meant deforestation, the poor livelihoods of smallholder farmers, stunting, food waste, obesity. Yes, it broadens the scope, but also the opportunities. It also meant that we felt we needed to set targets that the world needed, not targets that you just can get away with, which is the case still with so many companies. So already 12, 13 years ago, we set targets of uh, gender diversity 50-50, which we have achieved a few years ago, uh, zero um, fossil uh, energy in our own uh, systems, which we have achieved a few years ago, uh, zero waste in our factories, which we have achieved five, six years ago. So it's these bolder targets that come from a stronger purpose and a little bit more courage. And then we were actually not afraid to put these targets out there, the 50 targets for Unilever, uh, make, made us feel uncomfortable, but we made very clear that we needed the partnership, that we couldn't do it alone. And all that created a momentum in the company. It established a level of trust that according to Globescan was well beyond the levels that even companies like Patagonia were achieving. And it allowed us to expand our circle of influence, to uh, get involved in issues that uh, uh, allowed us bit by bit to um, go deeper and deeper in the bottom, to the bottom of the pyramid. To, uh, uh, Paul, if I may, uh, because you, you describe such a sequential strong path, but it starts at the personal level. And uh, you describe how you've taken so many people in Unilever now through that journey. I mentioned to you that last week, the Institute actually piloted a program in the Panamanian jungle all about that. And by the way, forgive the nosebleed. I scratched myself this morning and of course now it starts. I hope I wasn't distracting you. Mm. But um, the, as long as you I can know, imagine that you that slapped you directly because you got a prize, <laughs> uh, the comedian yeah. giving the presentation. <laughs> yeah, well, comedians are doing really well in the world at the moment. Uh, I, I respect their leadership. Uh, but, 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 but that might be almost the most difficult first step. I mean, I, I can just see so many of these maybe particularly american or uh, hierarchy sensitive companies uh, in places around the world where leadership is not about vulnerability how do you even get people to start to talk about that perhaps you could share some insights there yeah no no this uh, it is not easy i mean we're making it sound easy but it isn't um... And it took Unilever a few years to really get it into everybody and the culture. And then you nearly need to restart again, partly because the world is changing so fast, partly because of the rejuvenation of people coming into the company. But the Rumi, who was a 13th century poet in Iran, said it very well when he said, yesterday I was smart. I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise. I'm changing myself. It really starts with self-awareness that is uh, at the roots of this 
human transformation that we talk about. So the fact that we spent a whole year getting our own people on board was important to me. I call it the dinner table conversation. If you can't right. hold your, your own when you're being attacked, uh, let's say because of plastics in the oceans or on carbon emission or on deforestation, and you cannot explain or feel good about the company you work for, which regretfully is the case for many people, then obviously yeah. you have a conflict between your own values and what you think is important and your company values, and it doesn't work. So we spend a lot of time on helping people discover their purpose, how they could get to practice in influencing others and getting results as a company. And that probably is the most important thing. And it starts by listening, to be honest, and creating awareness like anything. Uh, it's well said that we have two ears and only one mouth, but you have to listen to your people, your communities, your suppliers, your trusted peers, understanding what the issues are that are out there. And that probably takes more time and more courage. And that is what we spend a lot of time on uh, in the initial stage. And the more we actually made the company outside in and started to uh, reflect this outside world, and so many companies are inside out, but the more we brought these realities in, which was really at the roots of what we were trying to address, uh, the more we obviously unlocked these enormous opportunities where we as a company could start to make a big difference. Now, you know, in Unilever, you talked about these different levels of uh, authority. But in Unilever, you had the board authority. So if you lead by example, I can see people following. Uh, in your role at Imagine, you're advising other industries, other companies, and perhaps you're seeing companies that aren't leaders, that aren't comfortable making that first move. Um, what have you seen happen and, and how have you seen people break through that? You have to uh, understand the reasons for that because uh, it's not simple uh, to, to just point fingers or say they're more responsible or less responsible. You have to understand first before being understood. It might be because of fear. Uh, it might be because of ignorance. Things are moving so fast. We see many companies underestimating the, uh, the speed of technology and what is not possible. It might be because simply they don't have the scale themselves to do things. I work now with 70 fashion companies and they've gone together, for example, because it's such a dispersed industry. They've gone together to um, uh, buy uh, green energy. None of them can do that alone. So there might be different bottlenecks that you have to identify. The first thing we really spend time on with these CEOs to explain yeah. the numerous opportunities that are embedded in the sustainable development goals to understand what they are trying to achieve with their organizations and come with some very simple immediate solutions that actually go to the bottom line. I believe that 60, 70 percent of the issues that we have today can actually be addressed already today with technology that is available, but also in a way that is more profitable and or makes your company more faster. So it's a matter of, you know, of, of having these conversations and, and getting there. When, um, when you have the discussion with CEOs, as I mentioned, they all have a strong desire to do better and to grow. There are a few, um, there's one category, but there are very few that prefer the status quo or to go back to where we came from. And there I would just simply suggest uh, don't spend too much time with them. They're most likely heading to the grave. Hold on. Was already anyway. But, but, but because so far I've understood everything you said. But here I have a small disconnect because when you talk about purpose, I feel you speak from the heart. And when you just spoke about how to convince industry leaders, you spoke very much from the head and you talked about appealing to the business line, top line and bottom line. But that purpose needs to start in the heart, I believe. So as a advisor and as now the wise man in the room, how are you connecting with people in leadership roles that need to set the example at the heart level? How does that work? Yeah. So the one thing that we do is imagine and why we created that is that most people are really on the left side of the brain and the rational part of the transformation that uh, you refer to but uh, we think that the human transformation is probably the most important and most powerful one so the way we do it actually is bring them to the location getting them out of the office and bringing yeah. what i would call the real world too many 
are too busy uh, and isolated from some of these issues to really get it inside of them. What sticks to the brain actually has to go through the heart. And yeah. uh, that is important. We, we just uh, convened about 20 of the biggest food companies outside of London last week to talk about the uh, looming or existing food crisis already and the, uh, the, the challenges uh, related to the war in the Ukraine. It's making significantly worse. 400 million more people defending on the, depending on the food coming from there. Uh, but we met at a farm. Uh, we met at a farm. Uh. We asked a farmer who was generous enough to say you can just use it. I didn't even want compensation for that. But it brings people to another environment. It makes them human. It takes the shield down and it leads into other types of conversations than what you normally would have. And, and what we have seen actually is um, during COVID, the, the CEOs that did better were those CEOs that had these skills that you're referring to, Mark, of uh, humanity, humility, uh, empathy, compassion. Uh, they were in, in inherently already a stronger sense of purpose um, and uh, understanding the power of the partnership, uh, thinking a little bit broader to other stakeholders like the planet and future generations. These are, in fact, the CEOs that instilled the confidence, the trust, uh, also help these organizations navigate these very choppy waters. We think that if we focus in every category that we have and where we need to attack the issues, you can find yeah. 20 percent of the categories that have these CEOs, and that is what we focus on to create these tipping points. Yeah, yeah. So you create a tipping point within an industry. Uh, good. Let, let's follow the roadmap because I know you used to be a CFO. I am a numbers challenged, I would say. Uh, but one of the titles of your chapters caught my attention when you said one and one, one plus one is eleven. Please explain. <laughs> Well, we talked about getting um, we talked about getting our own house in order and uh, earning a seat at the table. And I think we've talked that enough. How do you implement it? How do you set bold targets? How do you make them public? How do you measure and hold yourself accountable? These are all things that you can do yourself, but it only brings you so far. Um, then you discover that there are some of the bigger things. If you do them and your competitors in the industry don't do them, you actually are at a competitive disadvantage. Um, right. So some of these things you have to do together. Sometimes, because as I mentioned, you don't have the critical mass. Sometimes it would put you in 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 a bad position. So, what our two chapters of partnership are about? One plus one is eleven. Is really optimizing within the current system in working with partnerships with uh, your own industry, uh, your suppliers, and your value chain, if you want to, and the broader network. So, so that partnership, um, for example. In Unilever, we created the Partner to Win program. In the past, the whole procurement organization was rewarded basically on finding the lowest material and, and frankly, not, not very concerned on how that lowest uh, input uh, came about. Now we put uh, variables there around sustainable standards, uh, innovative uh, capabilities in working with suppliers. And we significantly changed our relationship with our suppliers. We put programs in place to help our suppliers, uh, three levels, uh, obviously an incentive system, the higher the level, the more the business was with Unilever. But it created an enormous positive energy, uh, also at the supplier level. Uh, because of these partnerships, a lot of costs were taken out of the system. We were able to move significantly faster to sustainable sourcing or address some of these burning issues without actually incurring costs. We obviously use some of these savings to manage it smartly, but we could grow the business very profitably at the same time. So that is really the one plus one is 11 partnership. You see that um, at Glasgow at the COP26, uh, uh, the, the race to zero, race to zero breakthrough, race to resilience, where coalitions have been formed, uh, coalitions around shipping or airlines or food that went together and say, together we're moving to regenerative agriculture, together we're decarbonizing the airline industry and providing, uh, investing in hydrogen to move faster. So that is, um, th these are the type of coalitions that companies need to be part of. Then the next chapter in the book is that uh, it takes three to tango, and that yeah. is more difficult systems changes that we need. And that's really where net positive thinking and net positive advocacy comes in. You know, um, 
real systems change or attacking the true underlying causes is actually very difficult, especially with short-termism that has crept in. So that is uh, requires different skill sets, uh, but but also is more rewarding. Ultimately, we cannot solve the issue of climate change or food security if we don't have the governments put the right rules, laws, regulations out there. Uh, we have perfer subsidies on fossil or perfer behavior on food that drive it in the wrong direction. And yeah. uh, this is where the real systems change happens. Well, I remember you saying last time we spoke uh, that a dead tree is worth more economically than a live tree. It's something that stuck with me. And as we were indeed in the Panama jungle and I was looking around at the beauty there, every time that comment struck me. But something is changing there, right? I've, I mean, it's, it's encouraging that, was it this month, both in Europe and in America with the SEC, uh, first proposals are being uh, uh, published around actually holding, so creating transparency, I guess a, a uniform transparency around uh, the eco impact. Do you see this as just the first of many steps that are coming down the line? Well, when the issues are being identified, when people are made aware of them, you see a thousand flowers bloom. Now it's time to make a bouquet out of that. We have probably five, six hundred standard setting efforts in the world. Uh, the definitions aren't yet very clear. People are a little bit confused of what is materiality, how to make it comparable within a sector, between sectors. So a lot of work is needed. That is one of the reasons why Europe is moving aggressively to the European Green Deal, to the taxonomy, to uh, things like the circular economy packets farm to fork. Uh, that's why we have created the, the Task Force of Financial Disclosure on Climate Related Risk, the TCNFD. Um, that's why you see the SEC now getting interested. In fact, the previous government in the US yeah. banned the word ESG, which is mind boggling to me, but now people uh, are pushing for it, including the financial market, by the way. Um, so you, you see, uh, I would say you see an increased uh, movement, but not yet at the speed and scale. Uh, one of the most important announcements was actually in Glasgow, the establishment of the Sustainable Standard Board with Emmanuel Faber, who used to run uh, that and is going to chair. Yes very courageous decision and it needs all of our help so it is moving in that direction we have seen four times faster legislation coming in since COVID than before COVID so here again companies would be well uh, advised to work together in the take three to tango to wait for that legislation and start complaining is not the answer to work together to get the right legislation is really to the benefit of the companies that take the lead but it also results in, in really an environment that is better for business in the end. So okay. well, these things are happening, but I would argue still strongly we have more to do. You take climate change, 14% increase predicted still in the next 10 years when we need a 50% decline. We cannot say that we're there. Uh, no. And no. and for all the other factors of the uh, sustainable development goals. Well, as well. So, uh, you might call that the elephant in the room. And I know you dedicate a chapter to that. So I, I actually wanted you to talk about that. Just uh, look, you've been in different organizations at different levels. Uh, why is it so important? What do you mean by addressing the elephant in the room? And why is it so important? Well, the elephant in the room is basically a chapter that is the last chapter for us is really once we have given people confidence that they can make that transition towards a more uh, responsible business model, towards becoming a net positive company, mm -hmm. we actually point out that ultimately it's about truth, uh, truth and truth and trust. Sorry, ultimately it's about tr trust based on transparency, based on truth. And ultimately that can only come from uh, that consistency in all you do. It's often what you do in the dark that makes you shine in the light. So what we see is a lot of companies are willing to celebrate some things that they're good at, but then not willing to embrace some other things that undermine their own actions, to be honest. An example yeah. of making strong commitments on climate change, but then financing their trade associations to go in a different direction. One second, uh, can she come here? I can sign it here. I'm going to call. I really, that's, I said that. Uh, hold on for one second. Hold on for one second. I have an emergency here. Hold on for one second. Oh, yes, of course. Well, um, so sorry. We'll go on. We'll no, go on. no, that's happened. Well, I mean, I, you were just about to describe, I think, so many companies actually stop from moving forward because they know that one piece, one chain, chain link isn't perfect yet. So, and, and, and it holds them back. Yeah, so what the elephant in the room is about, I apologize, is to be really consistent. 
you know, we have $3.5 billion in lobbying in the US still. And as soon as uh, Biden came out with his proposal to attack climate change, then the trade association started to go against it. The same companies that had made wonderful commitments on climate change were actually undermining that indirectly with the um, with the trade associations. 10% of our GDP is offshore. 20% uh, of the top 500 companies never pay tax. They think it's more important to avoid paying tax than to run a business properly. We saw GE having more tax lawyers than, than anybody else on the payroll and look what happened to them in the end. So uh, we talk about corruption. We talk about CEO salaries. It used to be 20 times uh, 30 years ago. It's now 380 times. It cannot be healthy. Many of these salaries not linked to performance either. So people are looking at this and saying, Saying, are our bosses real? Are they sincere? Um, we see car, uh, targets being set to get money out of politics. When the dreadful events happened on January 6 in the US with the storming of the Capitol, less than six months later or 12 months later, many of these companies start financing these same politicians who still don't recognize the elections. These are the type of tougher challenges that I know are not easy, but these are the type of tougher challenges that the uh, business community needs to start addressing in a more consistent uh, way. And if they don't do that, they are actually increasingly undermining that that trust that, that actually is increasingly the bigger part of value creation. Yeah, and that gets, I mean, um, you talked earlier about uh, trust and transparency. And I think this this is really an unlock that I'd like you to just focus a little bit more on. Perhaps you could talk about a situation where you were the leader where you decided to go transparent, even though there were things that you weren't happy with yourself yet. Uh, well, I think with this, my, my slogan is always, it's better to make the dust than eat the dust. Uh, we were the first to go on uh, uh, putting all the ingredients on, on the label for perfumes. We were the first to disclose our tax principles. We were the first to um, um, uh, work with the OECD on the brand erosion and profit sharing plans. So I've always felt that we needed to work in transparency. Now, what is in uncomfortable is I had to stop all of our operations in these tax havens that I inherited that were not related to our business. I had to explain why our tax policies were where they were when some people wanted to go further. Um, you know, the uh, making our ingredients available on perfumes and other things, uh, people even internally felt that they would give uh, give a competitive disadvantage to us. Uh, we asked Oxfam to uh, audit our human rights uh, in our value chain. We took the toughest country, uh, Vietnam, to do that. Uh, there were some areas that were highlighted, even for Unilever, that were not easy. Discussions if we should publish a report unedited, uh, yes or no. I always felt we should and always felt the more transparency, the better within the limits of competition, as you can understand. But it never hurt us when we thought we would be attacked by the press for all the issues that came out of a report in Vietnam. People said, wow, if Unilever has to deal with these issues, can you imagine how tough it is for other companies? And, and it actually created trust. It made more people wanting to work with us. So these areas require courage. They're not easy. You need to think about that. It's not doing everything or, or having the elephant in the China cabinet, but you need to have an increasingly more courage. Even today, uh, more than half of the companies showed, don't set targets on diversity. Uh, half of the companies that set targets on diversity don't want to publish their progress. 50% uh, of companies uh, don't uh, report on the uh, value chain. Uh, very few companies have issued a human rights report. I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a responsibility running the business either. And increasingly society, employees and others are of that same opinion. Why being forced to do things that are so obviously going to happen? Why not take that initiative with the right group of people to drive to these tipping points, uh, Mark, that we are talking about? Well, so now you get to a, a point which I think many of the people listening to this conversation actually live in. One where perhaps at the very top, there are wise people that feel that these are necessary steps to take and want to go there. One where at the bottom of the organization, there are millennials and Gen X coming in and demanding change, setting new norm. But there's a middle, a huge middle of the organization. And there's a culture which perhaps is far more conservative. Can you talk about what to do when that culture just isn't right yet? How do you go about addressing that? 
Yeah, well, for many people uh, uh, saying the challenges of mid organizations and some of the things that you're referring to, I think are their own challenges. The first thing I would address is make it my problem as a leader in the company, don't make it their problem. Often they are operating under the wrong boundaries that you have set in the first place. You know, uh, most people want to do the right thing, but if the boundaries aren't there, it drives the wrong behavior. Uh, I give you a very simple example. Our salespeople, if, if our salespeople would be rewarded on the number of orders they have to write, they're going to behave in a certain way. If we would reward the same salespeople on customer service or customer satisfaction, they're going to behave in a different way. One of the reasons in Unilever that I immediately um, uh, abolished uh, quarterly reporting or giving guidance and other things was very simple because I needed to move the boundaries that drove that behavior. So when middle management is, is stuck, they're stuck for a reason. And often the reason is that the, the boundaries that I put upon them are, are, are uh, making it impossible for them to do the right thing. Yeah. So the leadership team should get involved there. There is this notion in business that uh, complexity, delegating complexity upwards is, is bad because it, it, it shows that you're not a strong manager, that you're weak. It's in fact the opposite. Complexity needs to be delegated upwards and owned by the leaders. When people in Unilever came back and said, we have a lot of bottlenecks because we have different objectives between the different departments, we fixed that. When people said we have, um, uh, an organizational structure that gets in the way to change that, to, to drive yeah. forward the business model. We change that. So these bottlenecks need to be embraced by, um, by uh, the leadership. The leaders, that, yeah. That is the most important thing. And then obviously you have the normal tools and all that stuff that you know, the training that you develop, uh, the systems that you put in place. We completely uh, overhauled our training programs. You would not recognize them. Uh, the way we recruit and the quality of people that we recruit, the incentive systems that we put around it. I don't have to tell you that because that's normal stuff that anybody should be doing. You cannot build a gender uh, balanced organization, for example, if you don't have the best policies out there. If you don't uh, ensure that these policies are implemented, if you don't hold people accountable for that, if you don't drive these um, um, uh, uh, unconscious biasness, these these uh, behaviors that often get in the way. So we were very strong and shift on that. And it also meant changing people when we couldn't see the progress that was desired. And uh, so it's a tough exercise. Making your company more sustainable, more responsible, net positive is a higher level of leadership than what most yeah. companies are exercising now. So you need to be up for that challenge. It's funny you say that because there is a, an IRG growth study data point that talks about breaking down the barriers as being one of the key uh, enablers of success. And even among the overperformers, only 52% say that they think they're somewhat good at it. So it's clearly a huge oh. challenge. Can, can, can I zoom in? We've got a few minutes left, uh, specific to marketing. We've got a lot of CMOs listening in on this call. Um, we've talked about multi-stakeholder growth. Uh, that takes understanding the needs, the drivers uh, of, and, and actually value, in the minds of all these different stakeholders. What, what do you see as the role of marketing in helping the CEO and the rest of the company move through such a transition? Well, the role of marketing are multiple roles, but they are very, uh, very important ones. The, uh, the, the most important thing is, in fact, you know, this is about um, serving societal needs and being in touch with society. That's the role of marketing. It's the only department, to be honest, in the first place that is sensing has always been there to sense and we've lost that direction to some extent. So so that I think is, is the most important thing. Then the second thing is obviously to get that translated into specific action. The most important thing at the end uh, of what the company stands for is actually communicated through the brands that the company sells. And increasingly, it's not only the functional benefits anymore, but increasingly what you stand for as a company, as a brand that goes way beyond that. For Unilever, yeah. Men Dove stands for women's self-esteem. Health Boy stands for helping a child reach the age of five. Domesta stands for attacking the issues of open defecation. So the marketing community are often these catalyzers for change, for bringing in that outside uh, need and driving that internally. And then obviously um, you are in most companies, the marketing community is the talent pool. It still is the biggest source of of talent for CEOs and for 
other leading positions in the company. So you do have a responsibility there as well, if I may say, of creating the right leaders. And, and uh, you know, I'd call those out as probably the, the more important uh, points here. And it's not easy yeah. to do because it happens at the same time that the marketing community has to deal with a lot of these other challenges that we talked about, not least the uh, fast pace of technology, uh, the bifurcation of, uh, of society. Um, you know, it's become more and more difficult to establish these connections to stay ahead of the trends that are happening. So I don't envy you, but if this community can do it, who can? It's as simple as that. Well, it, it, and, and, and it's becoming essential. You're, you're the chair at uh, Said. As you know, I work with Professor Andrew Stevens there. And what they are seeing in their research among students is that there's a perception among some, but it's an increasing group, that marketing is selling evil, is uh, driving people to consume things they don't need that the world can't can't actually deliver against and that hurt the world versus being the drivers of change and connecting and understanding these key stakeholder needs what a contrast uh, marketing has a, a job to do i think uh, marketing has a big job to do and it might even require a change in title to get a change in mindset but yeah as we mentioned before previously in the talk uh, just selling more stuff is not marketing anymore that's destroying the planet that's putting human uh, fellow human beings at risk that's uh, stealing from future generations if you want to be part of that join a criminal gang, but don't join the market <laughs> so what's this you you have a new title in mind no i'll think about it and i'll call you yeah, yeah okay all right give, well if i would give you my initial reaction i might put step on some people's toes right now oh well i, that, I don't think that's ever held you back in the past so why start now uh, paul <laughs> thank you for the problem. Uh, let, 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 let's end with, if you don't mind, some personal questions. I mean, do, do, do people call you sometimes an idealist? Oh, I don't know, because I've, uh, I've run a company that uh, grew back from 38 to uh, 55 billion. I created 300% shareholder return. I showed that what I've been perhaps an advocate of a little earlier than others uh, is uh, making very good sense now that it actually is probably one of the better drivers of value creation you need to be out there you need to take risk if you if you uh, tread these new paths uh, there are cynics and skeptics along the road i've had a fair amount of those in my career but ultimately if you're uh, strongly grounded and and a strong sense of purpose you stay the course and and you hope you're right you don't know if you're right but fortunately i think uh, many of these forces that we had anticipated perhaps a little bit earlier than others are uh, converging and uh, if I regret anything, is that probably I wasn't aggressive enough yet if I look at the out there. But uh, no, I'm not an idealist. I'm hopeful. I would say I, I'm an hopist, if you can call it that yeah. way. Yeah. But, you know, because any study that we do and any anything that I see, uh, the youth and, you know, the millennials and the Gen Z, they're so purpose driven. I get courage from that. The technology that goes faster than we always think, I get encouragement from that. The, uh, the fact that the cost of not acting now is higher than the cost of acting makes my job a little easier than when I started. So for right. all these reasons, I think um, we, we, we need to keep a level of hope. Uh, that's always the, the more uh, useful thing to drive change than, than fear, as you would well agree. And I think we are still at this moment of being hopeful, despite you know the, the populist in government, despite the wars uh, going up in the world. Uh, despite the uh, effects of climate change being increasingly more visible, I hope that finally uh, humans will come to this higher level of, of moral consciousness that we need and understand that it true leadership at the end is about putting the, um, the interest of others ahead of your own, knowing that by doing so, you're better off yourself as well. And increasingly, I see these moral leaders emerging and that gives me hope. Doing well by being good. If, uh, as a closing remark, I mean, you're here, we choose to listen and learn from you. So um, I think idealist and success in this instance, uh, clearly very, very uh, much hand in hand. Uh, wh what's your advice? You're talking to CMOs here. Uh, if there was one parting advice as a CEO that's been through this, they're trying to engage their organizations, what would be your, your closing thought? There's one parting advice. 
Well, I'd, I'd say I, I, it's the risk of repeating a little bit. I think the first thing is be aware of this enormous opportunity. I mean, I have too many people that take the easy route that it isn't possible, we've done it already, or it can be done, then you shouldn't be in that job. So try to see for your areas, for your companies, what the enormous opportunities are. Uh, what we have calculated uh, is that, uh, you know, over the next decade alone, it could unlock $12 trillion and create 380 million jobs by moving to this greener direction. So you need to ask yourself the very simple question we pose in the book, is the world better off because your company is in it or not? And you are responsible for ensuring that you profit from solving the world's problems. That's what you're paid for, not creating the world's problems. And that brings me to my second message, perhaps, that it does need courageous leadership. This is not easy. And it requires more from you than you've probably historically been able to uh, to have to release. So how do you get to really truly owning the problem? Uh, you know, there is something uh, in a store that uh, if you break it, you own it. And that's the same with society. Take responsibility of your total impact. Trying to understand that does take courage. So that transformative uh, 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 change that needs to happen in the company uh, requires your courage. And my final message is, you know, these are big issues that uh, you should not take alone on your shoulders. It requires the broader partnerships. And again, you are well placed as the marketing community to drive these partnerships better than anybody else. They're hard work. They expose you. They co require compromise. But it's only in these deeper partnerships, goal number 17 of the SDGs, that you really can get to the, the true changes uh, that we need. I know this community is capable of that. You've done that in many different areas. When you get together, you can truly not only move the boundaries and what companies stand for, what brands deliver, but also be part of the societal change. That is ultimately a key responsibility uh, that you have. And uh, I certainly look forward to walking that journey with you together in the years to come. Well, Paul, uh, you have walked that journey with us and we feel very supported. I know that everyone that's been listening to you, learning from you, is not just inspired, but also more informed on how to do this successfully. That was the goal of this conversation. And uh, I want to give you a real deep heart thanks on behalf of the, the IRG community. Thank you very much for taking the time with us. Well, thank you and everybody listening. Be safe and enjoy the weekend. Thank you. Thank you.